Hello, my name is Elliot Ward and welcome to another episode of Coming Clean With Me. And in my studio today with me is Professor John Marsden. He's the profession of addiction psychology for IOPPN, which is the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience. The IOPPN is a faculty of King's College London, Europe's largest centre for research and education in psychiatry, psychology and clinical neuroscience. And Professor Marsden has held professional appointments in the addiction field for over 30 years. He specialised in developing new medication and psychological therapies for people with opioid, stimulant and alcohol dependence. He's also the editor-in-chief at the Addiction Journal that publishes peer-reviewed research reports on pharmacological and behavioural addictions. And John, welcome to Coming Clean With Me. Thank you for being here. Oh, Elliot, what an introduction. Well, you're, you're an impressive man. Well, it's a joy to be with you and I'm, I've been looking forward to meeting you so thank you for this kind invitation. Fantastic I want to just dive straight in John and yeah. my first question is you know having studied all your background and everything about you you could have gone into any career in psychotherapy or psychology what, what took you down the route of dealing with addictions? Oh it's a lovely question I appreciate it and I guess there's a mixture of uh, accident and perhaps a bit of design and a bit of intention um, when I look over my shoulder at my career, and you know, it has been over 30 years, I can certainly even now visualize quite vividly um, the developing alcohol problem that my dad had. Okay. Um, so that was something that touched me as a, a boy. You grew up in that environment. I did, and he, he, d he really developed um, an alcohol problem over several decades from what looked and appeared to be social drinking. I remember I've got an image even now of him. He would arrive home quite late <laughs> at night after leaving work at the normal time, like right. 5.36, whatever. And I remember we'd, I'd be sitting in the front room with my mum watching TV or something, chatting, and the, the front door would open and close, and then the living room door would open. He would stand there and sort of stare. He had very bright blue eyes. I remember he would, and they would be sort of, sort of slightly teary almost, and he would sort of gaze across the room and sort of glare at me and say, I'm, and then he would say, I'm going to bed, for example. And so I, I, I grew up in that environment and I studied psychology at University College uh, in Bloomsbury. Uh, it's now a sofa shop but back then there was a there was an amusement arcade on Tottenham Court Road next to Goode Street tube station I know Tottenham Court, I went to London University I know Tottenham Court Road very well there we go so I used to walk past um, this amusement arcade and I sort of see the same characters yeah. sitting on stools putting coins into the slot machines and I remember being fascinated about what appeared to me to be a, just a completely crazy pursuit really mm. um, so I was interested in behavioural addiction such as gambling I then luckily uh, I, I did uh, a masters in psych applied in clinical psychology I got a scholarship to do a PhD that was in alcohol I actually worked at the occupational health department at London Transport okay. um, and back then this is a few decades ago London Transport had a, had a, a, an, a, an employee workforce of about 40,000 people and um, therefore it had a prevalence of problems that a mid-sized English town would have. So I did my PhD in alcohol. After that, I worked for a, a treatment agency that was very much on the street. And so that brought me really up close and personal. Dealing with what type of addictions? Well, back then it was, um, it was acute homelessness right. um, that was then associated with a lot of heroin. Okay. Um, eventually we had crack cocaine, so smokable cocaine, as yep. you know, Elliot. Um, and then we were also trying to help people who were vulnerable to acquiring HIV and then yeah. hepatitis C. And then I've um, and then I worked over at the institute where I haven't left. So I'm I have had the pleasure um, of sticking to a career in this field, which is not that common. It's not the most attractive profession for yeah. people to join, and there's not a lot of funding. A lot of new doctors don't see it as a career path that is attractive. But I'm, I've had so much, I'm, I'm grateful 
but I've had, I think, some successes uh, and I've seen things occur and change that have just been really inspirational to me. So I've sort of, I've kept at it and maybe, you know, over the over the decades, I've been able to attract some money to do research and things and, and keep going. Yeah, it's difficult to get funding for research in this field. It really is. And, and I, I sometimes I get a, a little bit chippy. I, I work with colleagues in North America and the National Institutes of Health there. In a way, they have developed most of the evidence for the, the, the effectiveness of treatments that we have through uh, an agency called NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse. And that's needed because of the scale of the problem there. And over here, you know, we have had initiatives, and there's some at the moment that are very welcome, but a lot of the time we've had to propose studies that are competing with other diseases. Mm. Um, you classify it as a disease? I would say it's a, a brain disease. I have no difficulty with that. Um, if it's not in the brain, I don't know where it is. Okay. Um, I guess there's two things that have happened to me. I've been just astonished, Elliot, by the development of science, the neuroscience of addiction. Definitely. has been a triumph of my career, and I've played a, a, a scant role in it. But at the same time, I think what I've learned and been impressed with almost at the same time has been the knowledge of the sort of social disadvantage that people experience, the structural inequalities that can correlate or underpin addiction. So I, I wouldn't say, I mean, it's a sort of curious brain disease in which it's got such a social manifestation. But we know a lot about the, uh, the neuroscience of addiction, which yeah. is just amazing. Because there's a lot of people who say it's not a disease. You know, it's just, you know, just quit, just, just stop. You know, they don't quite understand that it is a disease that affects a lot of people, thousands of people. Well, I, th I think the first thing that you, um, if you come to this topic fresh, mm. and first of all, so many of us know about it. We we read about, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, uh, celebrities that die. We read about stories of, of people overdosing in the press. Last year, there was 100,000 poisonings, fat fatalities in the US. But I think the thing that I come to, I often use this clinically, is that it is a puzzle why we should be addicted to drugs and alcohol. Okay. It doesn't really make much sense why we would consume something that causes us harm. But I think, and I think we've got answers to that riddle, but I think starting out with a curiosity that says, look, this, you know, working clinically with a patient, this is strange, isn't it? Why, why could this have happen? Why hasn't this gone away? Do you think we're a dopamine-seeking nation? Well, I think it, the main drugs that we might talk about uh, today, um, let's say cocaine, for example, yep. just, just to name one that's so common and harmful, it's a very, very potent liberator of uh, brain stores of dopamine. Yep. Uh, it also prevents the reuptake of dopamine. So yes. That's where dopamine goes naturally back into its storage site. So it sloshes around and it causes partially, along with norepinephrine and other drug uh, neurotransmitters, it causes the effects that people seek. You know, this activation, this confidence, energy, etc. It's a nice feeling for people. It, if it didn't give the reinforcement that people expect it to give yes. at some degree it wouldn't be used it wouldn't be misused um, but you talk about dopamine I think we I think there's a dopamine model of addiction that we know lots about okay. we have identified structures in the brain that are so important to the way we live our lives and all of them are completely bashed by cocaine and other drugs of misuse. And that's been an incredible discovery of what exactly goes on when we, we take a drug repeatedly. It's also helped us really develop some medications that are targeting to those brain systems. I think we ask a lot of ourselves. Uh, we expect a lot. Uh, if we work, we, we often want to change our mood rapidly um, our attention span sometimes can be short so we live in a very charged culture I think we're so, very 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 few times that we spend times being present and aware of ourselves without seeking some form of you know escape oh you you, you say it so uh, beautifully really because if only we could 
be peaceful and allow our thoughts to just arrive and to stay with us for a while and then just fly off into the ether and be calm and mindful. And under the, if you like, the conditions, the vicious cycles of addiction, I think a lot of the drugs that people take, they're so distracting. They occupy our thoughts. Yeah. They direct our attention to places in the world in which we are sold a view of the future that's false. Yes. And, you know, we are, we are told... It's our a perception th- of reality. Our thoughts are presented to us in which taking a drug is going to make things better yeah. or it's going to make us feel less bad. Yeah. And there's, there's, as, you, as you well know, there are, there are cycles of motivation that move from sort of hedonic pleasure mm. into then relief of feeling unwell. Yes. You know, and we get that uh, duality as a vicious cycle. So, I, you know, in a way, when, as I'm sure you know, you know, when you work with your patients, what's so pleasurable is to hear people say that they've got their thoughts back. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, that they feel clean in their, you know, it's like someone's cleaned the windows, mm. you know, and they are feeling once again able to make rational decisions, to evaluate stress mm. and to be to be peaceful and that and that, I suppose that's the reinforcing thing for me is that that is so wonderful to 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 help someone achieve I also think um, to become reconnected I think when you have an addiction you become very disconnected you know eventually it becomes you and your usage of your drug on your own and you become disconnected from life from your family from friends you know, I think I think reconnecting is a huge thing. Yeah, absolutely. There, there is this sort of narrowing, isn't there? So that as if we imagine someone moving through, not in a linear way, but, but progressively from you know occasional recreational use, uh, it's normally a progression and a narrowing towards a much more isolating setting where you're you're, you're often not always but you're often using more alone than with in company unless you're with a bunch of people that are yep. in the same path to destruction as it were and you know i mentioned the brain structures that we know about and it is the perfect storm unfortunately there are kind of three main bits of our brain that get what are, name those three for me <laughs> okay well well the <laughs> If you, if we could take a slice through the middle of your your head right now and open up the kind of the section behind your eyes towards the middle, we would we would be able to ide- identify three areas, and they've got funny names. Okay. okay, so we've got one called the nucleus accumbens. Yep. Okay, it's involved in reward and the signalling that something is worth doing because it makes us feel good: food, sex, drugs. We then got another one that's sort of wired to it called the amygdala. There's one called the extended amygdala that works forward. That's involved in the processing of emotion. And unfortunately, during drug dependence, it becomes maladaptive in terms of stress management. What an awful situation. No one wanted to feel more stressed, did they? No one sets out to be addicted. But stress regulation goes. The other one in this little triangle is called the hippocampus, yep. um, and that's involved in memory. <clears throat> and what we've got then, if we think of those as a little triangle, we've got a structure called the dorsolateral striatum, and that's involved in habit formation. Yep. And then we've got a pro- projection right to the front of our heads called the prefrontal cortex, and that's involved in decision making. Yes. So you can, if you imagine a simple story, We've now got a, a brain that is much more sensitized to being rewarded by the ingestion of a drug. We've got a structure that's laying down memories yep. that that experience should be repeated because yes. it's clearly important. And then we've got corruption, really, of a structure that helps us f- process emotions and, and deal with, with stress. All of that laying down very powerful uh, learning memories that signal when we chance upon um, a place, um, a time of day, a thought, um, an object, 
a feeling. A hook. A hook. Yeah. Those cues signal that whatever else we're doing should cease because we need to obtain a drug. Yeah. And that is just a perfect storm of brain structures that we need routinely to live. But the brain is the brain has obviously thought to itself, okay, well, it looks like um, I appear to be I appear to have been given cocaine in my diet. Uh, parts of my liver are synthesizing this, so I know what this substance is. It looks like it's now an addition to my diet. Okay, I'm not quite sure why that is, but what we'll now do, this is the irony, I think, of dopamine. We're now going to re release less dopamine than we did before. Yeah. Because we're getting a source of it externally. That's right. And the terrible consequence of that is that the person who is now addicted finds the everyday things less pleasurable. Yeah. And that locks them into, you talk about this idea of narrowing and then opening it up. It just locks them into just doing the same thing over and over, but getting less and less for and it. And then their quantity increases and their frequency increases. To the, to the point where through, you know, the pro metabolic process of tolerance, the quantities that some people could consume would, would completely floor someone like ourselves who has no drug yep. tolerance. Yep. Um, yeah, and that's where I think we bring in a, a more medical, even public health concern that some of the drugs that are used now are so potent, they, they can be fatal, you know, a single ingestion. Some of the strong fentanyls, the, yeah. the, the opiate <clears throat> analogs that are being um, introduced so widely in the US and have been. Um, but yeah, tolerance is a real problem. And, you know, the idea of needing more and more to get what you're wanting to get is an illusion because ultimately the brain has decided to adapt to the yeah. point where you're not going to get it. I've got a question for you that a lot of my listeners ask that I thought I'd uh, put to you. Do you think it's nature or nurture? Do you think people are born with this addiction? Or, or you know, do you think nature or nurture? It's a really, really interesting question, isn't it? So I guess... I would imagine your listeners would start with a position that I have when I think about this, which is that, well, it's surely it's, it's, it's based on exposure. It's based on coming in contact with this thing. And that, you know, what I've just been talking about really is a, is a study or a description rather of changes to the addition of a drug into the person's head. And that takes us some distance, but what we do know is that some of the processes that are part of the addiction story are heritable. So yes. what that means is they are part of the molecular biological Genetic predisposition. Genetic predisposition. Um, and, you know, I may, I might, I haven't, I've never tested it, but I might have a vulnerability marker for nicotine yep. dependence, for example. Um, I'm, we know of nicotine and we know about alcohol. So that does run, uh, alcohol runs very heavily in families. Genetically. Genetically. And then, of course, you, well, I, perhaps I mentioned my, my own dad. Yes. You know, I was then aware of what was going on. I grew up knowing and seeing that. And that has an influence. You could have an influence in both directions, couldn't it? it yeah, could that's true. It could make you seek out to explore and experience, or it could perhaps turn you away that's I, definitely true you can you could grow up being in that environment with a family member who uses a substance and go oh i should repeat that process or you could grow up and go wow I, i'm never going to do that oh my gosh look at look at the terrible outcome that it brings and i think you see that a lot you know sometimes you do a you could do an assessment with a person and you could say well tell me about your you know your family and stuff and sometimes they say well yeah i mean my my mum had a problem and my older brothers had a problem and so I've got one. Other times, you, you can find no trace of it. Yeah. You know, you go back to several generations and, and you think, well, why was that then? So, that, so I think the answer is clearly it, it is a heritable disorder yep. uh, to the extent we know. So nicotine and alcohol, well studied. The other drugs are elusive. Yeah, um, but there's also huge amounts of shaping and experience. Um, there's a really interesting example, though, of if we're thinking of personalised medicine, there is a hopeful future, and we've got one example in in the alcohol arena at the moment. But there's a hopeful future in which 
our molecular biological makeup should enable physicians of the near future to personalize the medicines that we we take for a condition wow. we've got one for alcohol so there's a genetic marker um and that has been shown in some studies that there's mixed evidence unfortunately but in some studies it means that a particular medication for alcohol if you have this marker that medication if right. you have a genetic predisposition there is a way of testing the body to see if you have that and what percentage of likelihood you are to have that addiction uh, yeah and also what the likelihood is that a particular medication is going to work okay and the, what's great about that is that if you don't have it well let's not let's not waste our money and your time on this medication if you do Let's well, give it why have it. they not got that for cocaine? We just haven't. The cocaine is is really elusive. Um, opioids as well, but there there there've been um, large genetic association studies done. There are a couple of um, what are called polymorphisms, so genetic markers, but nothing that's really reliable. Um, not clear why that is, and it could be. I mean, with nicotine, we're dealing with a, a, a receptor called acetylcholine, which has got a very sort of narrow band of action. Cocaine is all over the place. You know, we've got dopamine, we've got noradrenaline, we've got serotonin, we've got glutamate. It's like a, we've got a full suite. There's so many things to look at. If nature could have come up with a more complex and addictive stimulant, I don't know what it is. Cocaine really, if you wanted to come up with something that most people like if exposed to it yeah you know it's obviously dose related a high dose would never be fun for anyone but at low doses a lot of people do like it probably about 10 percent of people that are exposed to it become addicted is that what you think 10 percent? i would say about that and really and really really addicted that's interesting because i think if i look at my feedback my client bases and and the kind of information i get back from the thousands of people out there um I've had a very interesting response when I've asked, how long did it take you mm. from doing your first line to become a regular user? And I'll mm. define regular user as once a week, every week, or two to three times a week, or five to seven days a week, okay? And I've had people say, the, the average I would look at across the board is around about two years. Mm. So two years of dabbling before they suddenly became regular users. Mm. But I have had very few people who have used and then immediately become regular users. Um, but in the, f in, the, in the mainstay, most people have been using two, three, four, five years before they became regular users. Why do you think that is? What happens, I think, it, I mean, in terms of people that we both see, so we don't see, thankfully, the person that uses um, for a few weekends with a certain bunch of people at a certain time, and things change and they just, they exit the system. We don't see them again. Okay, true. Um, and that's fantastic. We, that's what we want in a way. Um, so the people we see are the people that have moved through those gates. They've gone forwards. Um, I think once you start to use at the frequency you're talking about, I have a habit of talking about low-level withdrawal symptoms. Yeah. Um, you know, if we're talking about smoking people understand don't they your listeners understand that someone is going to want to light up another cigarette to keep their nicotine of levels course. you know it's the, the classic it's model the cycle it's the cycle yeah and and deprived from it during a train or a plane ride or something they have withdrawals they have intense withdrawals so the first thing they do when they get off is find the space in the airport or the, outside the train station they have a cigarette so i think um we're aware that there is another driving system for a lot of addiction which is to um prevent or manage or reduce withdrawal symptoms i think sometimes that with the level you were talking about a moment ago that kind of weekly pattern, there's a sort of run over several days in which the person's decision-making is down, they are feeling tired, a bit dysphoric, a bit fed up, um, and by the time 6 p.m. arrives, or whenever it is, they're, they're dosing again, and then the dosing is dealing with some of those withdrawal symptoms. Yeah. Um, but I think what happens after a while, I mean, I deal um, a lot with 
a very severe smokable form of cocaine, yep. um, not cocaine powder or hydrochloride. And that's so powerful um, that it's almost determined that people use in, in intense but relatively brief runs. Okay. Uh, they just, I mean, it's so addictive and so consuming and so expensive, of course, that they really can't use any more than that. I haven't answered your question very well, I don't think, but um, it, I think after a while, people just reach a point where they have a moment of realization that it's got to stop. Yeah. And, and that might be that they experience cocaine-related chest pain, for example. Um, so they might feel very unwell. And the cocaine, obviously, has a, as a stimulant, has an acute increase in blood pressure. Um, but it also doesn't do any favors for our, our whole kind of cardio um, system. Um, so I think there sometimes can be adverse health effects. Okay. Um, anxiety and depression as well on the mental side. Yes. That mean people just sort of think, I just need to take some steps here. Um, and hopefully then in therapy, it's, it's really about trying to get underneath the thoughts. And also I think um, there's a lot of people who reach a point where it's affecting their families. It's affecting the dynamics of the family. Their partner may have left them or it's on the brink of leaving. It's affecting them not being present with their children. I think that affects them a lot. Yeah, and you can have you can have a period of time when I'm not saying it's a delusion, but maybe there's a there's a kind of hope that people aren't noticing, you know. And you're, there's a there's a secretive aspect to it. You see that obviously with alcohol in particular. Yeah, I see, I see a lot of people who use <coughs> cocaine as secret users. Yeah, that what I call the secret toilet flush. They're at home, they go and line it up at the toilet system. They do a flush, they do a line, they go downstairs, and they act perfectly normal watching TV with their partner. Yeah, except that what happens is the the sign that things are, are awry is that when it gets to whenever it is and the partner says, oh, I'm going to yeah. big day tomorrow, I'll turn in, the cocaine user says, oh, I think I might just stay up a little bit. I just need to do something or read something or do something on my tablet or whatever. And then they're up till three in the morning. Yep. Um, and so then they have regret. Why are they, they have the regret? They have this come down. You know, um, you know, I like to talk about pain and pleasure as almost a seesaw as it's co-located in the brain. You know, when you have when you have the pleasure rise up <clears throat> and the pain comes down, it has to it's almost an equilibrium. It always has to counterbalance itself. So then they have this big come down and this big regret. And, and I think the interesting thing, John, is this. This regret, where at four or five o'clock in the morning, they go, oh, my gosh, I wish I'd never done that. <laughs> they actually believe it at the time. The problem is it, it dissipates so quickly that either the next day, if they're a daily user, or two or three days or a week later, they're using again. Why, why do you think that memory dissipates so quickly? Well, it's the immediate uh, uh, conscious thought. You know, I can think of, I think of a patient of mine, and he, he said, I would, I would riffle through these sort of busted up old DVDs looking for something to play at four in the morning. He said, I do it all the time. With buyer's regret or remorse, I think. He, yep. you know. And that, the point about that is that that ought to be actionable. You know, what, what's the, why is the half-life of that like a New Year's Eve resolution? It's because the associative learning the pairing of times of day, places, objects, thoughts, feelings, people is so much more powerful. They're environmental factors. Yeah, they just they just come in and that thought oh, hold on. It's Friday at six o'clock. And then and then you can sometimes have these permission giving thoughts, you know, and there are many. For example, well I've been good all week. Uh, a little wouldn't hurt. Yep. Everyone else is doing it. I've got a bit of money in the bank. I deserve it. I'll just have one. You know, I mean, that's just a few. Isn't they're it? rationalizing but, it. They're rationalizing it and they're per giving permission to it as well. I and mean, one of the things I that, like that way of looking at giving permission to it. Yeah. And the other thing that um, is a torment is the some of the objects that become conditioned. So the classic one with cocaine, I mean, we're moving into <laughs> a cashless society, but I think it still works um, as an example. But one of the things for cocaine that becomes incredibly 
um, associated is the ATM machine. Yeah. Now, to you and I, that's a source of a couple of tenors for a, you know, a takeaway or whatever. And to someone who is using cocaine as a source of money, of course. So the thing is that, that, and some of my patients have a preferred ATM machine. It's the one they always use and and they visualize walking down to use it, et cetera. The trouble is with the ATM machine, of course, which is just an ATM machine to everyone else, but it becomes associated. There's millions of them in the world. Right. And so you come across any one of those, yeah. it can do the same it's thing. It's a trigger. Yeah. One, I mean, you, you were talking, I thought, very interestingly about um, thinking forward to the negative outcome of a drug-using event, for example. And I think, I think that can be an amazingly powerful therapeutic device. Yeah. Um, I feel sometimes like the things that I do are, are kind of borrowed from other aspects I think we do that with everything yeah and I I think you know so I mean I we've applied some of the therapeutic um, techniques of helping people with post-traumatic stress disorder for example but one of the things that I think you can do if you have a strong urge which is which often takes the form of um, feelings you know butterflies um, slightly clammy palms for example often a mental image so an image of the future occurs in which you're using a drug you might taste it you might smell it so craving is a kind of multi-sensory experience one of the things that we try and do in our uh, clinic is help the person think about that because you can't block it so just to think and ground yourself, and the various techniques of grounding. Yep. You might have an object you might get out of your uh, um, wallet, or like a playing card, or there might be a perfume you would smell, yep. whatever it is. You're associating it with something. Yeah, you would ground yourself. <clears throat> but one of the things you can do is you can play the tape forward. So you might say to yourself, okay, so really, you know, yes, I have been quite good this week, and rightly so, because I've made a commitment to stopping. And the first thing I've done is I've cut down on my alcohol or quit altogether, and I'm eating better and I'm sleeping better. But I can feel that urge, and this is the adversary I'm dealing with. And to play that tape forward and, and see yourself, I don't know, 4.45 the next morning, hearing the birds or, mm. you know, thinking, oh, no, I've got to go to work. Um, and just feeling that, pairing that future thought with the one that's calling you like a siren, you know, towards using, can really, it does a couple of things, I think. First of all, it checks the evidence for the current thought and finds that thought to be wanting. Because the thought, well, you know, a line's going to be great, um, only one. There's never one. No, it never happens. No, no. You'd have the first three in the first hour, and then then you're and, calling someone else for another and one. And then you've run out. Yeah, exactly. Then you're getting more, John. Trust and then you're reloading. That's what happens. Exactly, exactly. And then, and then, if you're drinking, then really you're buying cocaine so you can carry on drinking. That um, cocoethylene's then produced. Absolutely, you've got that. You've got that metabolite that's maximising both. That's when a lot of the, the cardiovascular problems occur but i think that idea of bringing that thought back in helps check the evidence and and finds that the evidence for the thought is wanting and actually it isn't one it isn't going to be that nice dopamine reserves have been depleted for the time being so it's not going to feel so good certainly not as it used to that's gone and all the time literally that that coping behavior strategy is occurring and it's interesting, isn't it? You wouldn't see it. You wouldn't be able to. It wouldn't be an evidence of it that the no. person's doing it. But as that process is happening, the seconds are elapsing, and as time moves on, the person suddenly thinks, "Oh, well, that's gone now." Yeah. And I often say, "Well, the best thing you should do now is you need to have something to eat." Yes. Yeah. I, I think I call that technique pseudo orientation, mm. where you're putting someone future progressing them. I actually to put a spin on it because I like them to turn around now and look back the fact you didn't take it and how much better you feel. So they're bringing back, ratchet those resources Perfect. back with them. Perfect. Because, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about thoughts. Yeah, definitely. It's all about cognitions and emotions. 
every single thing we do. Um, you know, when we... On a Friday night, many people in this country will, will, will have a drink. Um, they often eat energy-dense foods afterwards, <laughs> takeaways and so forth. Yeah. Our, our ability to make good, healthy decisions is dissolved in alcohol. Cocaine's an awful one for that, because what cocaine wants is you to take more. It's the greediest drug, probably more greedy than nicotine in a way, in that it just wants more consumption. And I think that's one of the cruelest aspects of it and I, mm. and I would I would you know whenever I get the chance of you know being able to come away from my you know normal working environment and talk to experts like yourself I mean it, I think it's so important isn't it to to help people realize there's no blame here there is change you have to be responsible but you shouldn't blame yourself because your brain has changed and yeah. that is the reality of an addiction. The great thing about it is, and you, I, I know you know the evidence of looking at some of the neuro, neuro, neuroplasticity. Yeah, the great thing. I knew that's what you were going to say. And the great thing about the neuroplasticity, so we, the, the, the little triangle of structures I mentioned, all that jargon a few minutes ago, they go offline. They, they, don't, they don't work well. The great thing with abstinence, and you've, you do have to stop, I'm afraid, Yes. They all come back online again. How long, how long before that neuroplasticity re-regulates re itself? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the, the, some very... Actually, you know what? Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. Just for the listeners at home who don't, don't understand neuroplasticity, can you explain what that is in layman's terms? Yeah, I mean, it's the, I suppose it's the idea, in, if you think of a brain structure, um, and you might be able to look at it, and there's a picture of it, you might assume that it works only in a certain way. Uh, and well, perhaps that, you know, after someone dies, it doesn't work at all. That it, yeah. that otherwise, it's working in the way it should do. The, the interesting thing is that it adapts and it can generate uh, a change in its function and as a consequence of drug ingestion over time. So it progressively changes in the way it works. It becomes, you know, plastic in terms of the, the meaning of change. Like a moulding. Yeah, and I think, and as I say, the... the, the, the I think the liberating and motivating thought about that, um, which can have crushing consequences under the conditions of addiction, is that with abstinence comes repair. And so um, studies have been done showing that, you know, comparing, say, the the, 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 the dopamine function, functioning of, of someone that's never taken a drug yep. compared to <clears> someone who um, has abstained for a month, six months, nine months, a year, two years, etc. At two years, you can still see differences, but okay. they, are, they are much, much narrower than, than, say, at six months. So I think, you know, every day that someone isn't using is a day of repair, but you are talking about a need for a, a huge, I mean, I, you know, I'm conscious as I speak that some people listening might be saying, well, this guy's just calling out for people to stop. You know, it's not easy to stop. Every day that you're not using is a good thing because yes. it means that your sleep architecture is improving and your, your diet perhaps. But I think under the, under the conditions of addiction that we're talking about today, you need to stop. Um, but the great thing about stopping is that you'll get your function back. Okay. Here's an interesting one. You know, let's say somebody is a regular user of three or four times a week, and I come across this a lot, and they go on holiday with a family for two weeks, mm. somewhere where they can't get it, right? And the weirdest thing is they don't even think about it until they're on the flight back and it's the first thing they're getting delivered. Why is that? But the thing is about what you've just said, it... it it is occurring thousands of times across the world right now. It's a real thing. It is an absolute thing. How do we explain it? I agree. In a way, some of the same triggers should have been exported to the holiday destination. But maybe there was distraction, maybe there was, there was other reinforcements such of you know swimming dancing eating conversation that occupied connected yeah but you're so right you get on that plane 
and suddenly there is this oh yeah that would be good wouldn't it and maybe there are more permission giving thoughts you know I'll list them again you know well, I haven't had any for two weeks I've got more money than I did before let's say um, I'll be keen to catch up with my friends etc so it's the depth of those associative learning changes I think that are I mean really really hard to, to cope with and I don't know why to be honest why there's a little a break like that would do the trick it's possible that there are low level reminders and the person's able to cope with them but you're yeah. right um, you can imagine someone returning and using almost immediately yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, a question I like to ask most of the people who are in professions who come on my shows and it's a, it's a personal thing because everyone has a slight different take on it but how would you define an addiction how would you define an addiction mm. I, I mean I tend to say it's a, an unwanted um, habit okay. um, so I would I would come at the idea that you don't want that state I mean I think if someone is so involved in it um, and would be resistant to any discussion then I don't want to apply the label okay. I don't want to say well you, you know I know you don't want to quit but you're addicted you know that just you know that has negative connotations I, I personally do so I think I think the idea of an unwanted risky or harmful habit okay. comes this close is how to I would it. define it John. yeah I would define an addiction as a behavior to a substance or a behaviour, a compulsion to mm. a behaviour that has a temporary relief that has a negative consequence. Yep. I think that's how I would I, define I, it. Very nice, and I like the way you brought in this idea of compulsion. Yeah, and I think I think you know w when we've got our clinical, we've got a big manual of um, mental disorders that we we diagnose, and the one for addiction has at the center it has craving and yeah. that and i think the idea of this distressing commanding thought that i need i want i must have the strong desire um does really capture it really yeah yeah i, I wanted to just pass something by you to see what you think I, I think a lot of human nature revolves around avoiding pain and seeking pleasure okay um, you burn, you put your hand on a red hot oven ring, you burn yourself, that's a physical pain, you go, oh, I'm not going to do that again. So we have this innate understanding of avoiding pain and we try and seek pleasure. Now, most things in life, I will say, have an element of pain, okay? You go to work, we'll call that pain to get money, to buy nice things, to have pleasure. We learn to drive a car, we'll call that pain, to have the freedom to get from A to Z, we call that pleasure, okay? Now, with cocaine and most drugs, but I'm going to use cocaine specifically here, with cocaine, there is a perception of pleasure first and the pain comes later. The drivers all of a sudden are the wrong way around. I think that's part of the problem. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think, I think that works. I think that works. I, I, I mean, I'd possibly use just different language to say the same thing. I think, I think there is, there's misdirection. Yep. So we are, I think I said it earlier, we are sold and presented with a version of the future that actually doesn't stack up to the facts. Yeah. And, and I think that um, is the nub of it, really. That uh, The other thing is, I think, once, once you've taken cocaine, it's then got its own greedy motor. You know, the drug is just, it, it just wants more and more and more, well beyond the ability of the brain to liberate any more dopamine. I mean, that's gone. And I think that's one of the cruel things, that there is, there is just this continued, I might call it reloading, you know, like, oh, let's, let's phone, you know, is, is Steve still up? Let's see if he'll come round on his phone. Hello, mate, got three for 100. Yeah, yeah, yeah. four tickets, <laughs> all that stuff. Um, I've got, I, I got an analogy that, you, that I read that you wrote that I think is fantastic. I love this. I'm going to steal this, by the way. Um, just tell us the analogy about the playground bully who puts the pound in and gets... Oh, that. I like that. oh well, that... Th th this, th th yeah, thank you. That's very kind of you. And by the way, Elliot, it's yours. Thank okay. you. You, 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 you know, it's yours. It always was yours, perhaps. Um, so I mentioned um, that I deliberately take therapeutic methods from other psychological areas 
and see if they work for addiction. I make no apology of doing that. I think it's, I think it's a really important thing. And, and not, not least because a lot of addiction problems are quite similar to the problems that don't involve drugs, yes. you know, that, that are debilitating, anxiety, depression, etc. So the example of the playground bully is often used as um, an analogy for people with obsessive compulsive disorder. Tell us what the analogy. Tell us what the what it is. So, um, let's imagine you um, you're starting to develop OCD, um, and before you go to bed, you're you're very worried about security. So you check the window latches. Yep. And there you go to bed, and after a while, this doesn't seem to. Have, I'm not quite sure. I'm reassured. So you, you check more of the window latches. You also check them a second time, just in case, to be sure. You then may check the uh, rings on the gas stove, make sure they're all off. Um, and so after a while, a person with a safety-related preoccupation, OCD, can only go to bed by doing dozens of checks. Um, and even most cruelly, I had a patient once who went to bed and then got up and did it all again yeah. before he had to go back to bed. And the playground bully example is just is basically saying, OK, well, uh, you know, it's a give me a dollar or I'll beat you up. And then so you give the dollar. And then a week later, it's two dollars now. You give two dollars. Five dollars gone up or I beat you up. So the, the bully wants more and more and more. That's like addiction, right? And that's like addiction. So the whole point about addiction is it, it wants you to, cake, to take more and more and more. And with the playground bully, if we take a stance, and this is like David and Goliath, isn't it? You take a stance against the bully, the bully shouts and screams and then just disappears. So I use that a lot to, to try and evoke the idea of taking a stand. Mm. And of course, with OCD, the way we help people is by exposing them to those uh, triggers <coughs> and, then, and then just not behaving. You know, what happens if we don't, you know, what happens if we leave the window latches open? I couldn't do that. Well, why don't we try? What's, what's the worst that can happen? Well, someone will break in. Well, should we, should we try it? And they don't. Now, of course, you want to lock the windows, but there's that. So the idea, I think, the idea that I've used often with addiction. Think about, think about a phobia. Uh, let's say you're a secondary school biology teacher, and uh, you've got an awful spider phobia. Mm -hmm. Okay, you hate them. You've always hated them. Your mum hated them, and she probably infected you with her. Um, hatred and loathing of spiders you can't be in the same room as one but it turns out you're a biology teacher right so and you teach a course that's called spiders or whatever I mean I'm making it up a bit um, that phobia will never go away through avoidance yep. the only way it's going to go away is through approach so what we would do is we would um, we would negotiate together as to how far away you would tolerate my plastic spider that I've got here on the, uh, in my pocket. We would go, and then we'd bring it closer, and eventually we'd, we'd, I'd bring out my real spider, and you'd have it on your hand, and then we'd, that would treat it. Okay. So with addiction, we can't avoid the triggers; they're all over the place. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do, we have to expose ourselves to the triggers. We have to be able, for example. Um, to hold in our hand a glass of wine and not gulp it in 25 seconds. Yep. To smell it, notice it, place it back on the table, take our time, think, be thoughtful. You mentioned earlier about the idea of mindful, you know, recapturing the beauty of our thoughts. A small quantity for enormous gratification. Yeah. So anyway, that's a long answer, but that's my... Well, I, well, I love that you brought up phobias because I know that you don't know this and I was smiling to myself. 
I used to do ITV, this morning show, live on air every single day, dealing with a phobia live on air in under an hour, and then they had the stimuli presented to them. Being in a cage full of pigeons, spiders on their hands, snakes. I didn't know In that. a bath of mud. No way. Like, yeah, I used to do that every day. Wow. In under an hour, so live. So what would you do, like rapid hypnotic induction? So rapid hypnotic induction. When you called, when, funny enough, when you spoke about earlier about getting somebody to move into the future and see the outcome and bring it back, that's what I would do, get them to see that. There was an amazing one I did in Trafalgar Square once. Had a lady had a fear of pigeons and they filmed this for ITV. And uh, she was terrified. And then within an hour, she was feeding the pigeons. She was hugging me. And I used to do that every day. There you go. Live on air. There you go. Every oh, well, day. That, well I, I had no idea. And that's, uh, that, I mean, that, but that is a great example of how we want people to have, it's a terrible jargon phrase, but for me, it's all about cognitive control. Yes. And then with cognitive control, you look at someone who's recovered from, say, an alcohol problem. The joy of that person being able to go out for a pizza with a bunch of mates, they're all having bottles of beer with their pizza, and the, you know, the recovered person's possibly drinking mineral water or something, but is quite happy, hasn't had to run away and hide, and you know, have a white knuckle ride experience of sobriety, is able to be close and personal, if you like, yeah. with the source of the addiction, but not to be upset by it. Yes. That is kind of what I mean. With cocaine, it's different. We don't. We, I, I rather there wasn't cocaine. I mean, we've got synthetic animals. Uh, we've got synthetic drugs that do peripheral anesthesia. We don't need this one anymore. But it's not going away anytime soon. But for example, someone being able to watch a TV drama and see it depicted, or read a magazine article, or let's say listen to your podcast and not be activated to yes. be able to sort of listen and process not and think, not be yeah. triggered I think there's a lot to do with the tribe mentality I say this to my clients I said first of all you have to break your tribe I always give the analogy I say if you sit in a barber's long enough you're going to get your hair cut you like that one? I do like that one that's great because like, it's like if you go to the pub and you sit around people who are using the propensity to use is going to be increased. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you go to a Land Rover dealership, eventually <laughs> you're going to buy a Land Rover. Yeah, um, you like the barber. I, I, yeah, I do. And I think, you I can think, have that, John. I, is that one mine? Yes, sure. Oh, oh, we're, we're, oh, okay. I'm walking out on air today. Fantastic. No, I, th I, think, I think that's right. I think that's right. And we... What I love about talking to you now is... There's, there's a bit of humour in your style which I thoroughly approve of I think I try myself also to be a credible um, practitioner um, it's my job to know um, I think we're still knowing you know, we're still yeah, finding out Definitely. But, um, and if someone's not interested then I wouldn't, I wouldn't serve them up brain science but it's amazing how often people are interested and, and, and the more you know and the more you can impart i think the more people feel you know empowered to take a, a stand and to you know realign reset recalibrate and get and get that outlook and uh, yeah. that's that's the that's the job i think i was reading some research um um, I can't remember who the author was because I was reading about four books at the same time. And it says that 30 days, roughly, resets the reward path system. Can you explain that? Well, I, I can't put a month on it. No, I found that interesting. But no, I'm just yeah, the, I mean, ni 90 days, three months, okay. is the one that we generally use for smoking. Right. So if you can get to three months. Actually, just explain to the listeners what a reward path system is. Well, the reward pathway system is, 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 is um, a very ancient and survival um, supporting um, aspect of the way our brains work so it was it evolved to enable us to survive and develop as a species so what, what and its primary function is food and sex okay okay so I like that, both generally your reward system is working well okay okay so the idea is that we find food reinforcing. It, it therefore means we have a, you know, we put enough energy in to do what we need to do, and, and sex for procreation, etc. And 
So the reward system uh, is based on um, memory, uh, noticing when there's a source of reinforcement like food and <laughs> sex in the, in the environment, and acting accordingly. The very same system is, is corrupted by drugs. Right. So just simple as so, that. So looking at nicotine, it's a 90-day Well, reset, I, 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 th- I, I think there is um, hmm. a huge amount of variability here, but I know there is some evidence. Um, I'm not sure if there is for cocaine, but I know for nicotine, if you've managed to quit for three months, so let's say 90 days, the likelihood that you'll stay abstinent goes up hugely. Now, um, that is something, you, you know, that quote that you read mm. is speaking to the idea of this recovery of function. Yes. Um, I've worked with... Sorry to interrupt you. I also think environmental changes. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, for me, um, I've been doing some work recently with psychedelic-assisted treatment, yes, which is a really I interesting space. And um, I think that's a, an example where that appears to possibly induce some very interesting changes that we can use therapeutically. But, I mean, the things that I would encourage people, you know, to do uh, really focus on sleep, diet, um, if it's cocaine, I think my prescription is often try to have a break from alcohol for a, a quite a while. Yeah, I, think, I, always I mean, they say go that. they go terribly hand in hand. Um, I always say to, to to my patients, three months of no alcohol, yeah. complete abstinence, and then let's discuss it. I think that's a wise counsel. Um, some people can't do it. Um, I've 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 had folk who have thought and lost possibly their confidence after a couple of months. And one of the problems with cocaine, for example, is that you can still detect it. We use a urine sample in the clinic. Um, It's only supposed to detect it for three days or so. And unfortunately, if you use a lot, we can still detect that for like two, even three weeks later, and it can be really dis- dispiriting for someone who says, look, I haven't I Yes, haven't I've heard, I've heard yeah, that with some yeah. of my patients. Much longer than you'd imagine, unfortunately. Yep. Um, and I, but I've had people that have coming in and they've, they're hating it. They, they're just, you know, this is just, I'm not feeling better. I feel um, my mood is low. I'm, I'm not sleeping well, etc. So, but toughing through to goodness look if we're if we're talking about someone that's using four or five times a week if they can not use for 30 days good things are happening yeah you know there's there's i guarantee their sleep is better their mood will have lifted and they will beginning they'll they will begin to have some of those thoughts that we've been talking about in our discussions these more kind appraising thoughts about resilience their stress um, ability is going to improve um, so good things happen is that the magic number I'm not sure um, but I, I if someone has come in to me and said look I haven't used for a month I'd be surprised if it's if, if they're really hating it I'm a great advocate of exercise I always get my patients to exercise I think it makes you feel good about yourself it releases serotonin you know it gives you structure uh, I almost go to the point where I say why don't you swap one addiction for another why don't you become addicted to feeling good about yourself why don't you become addicted to exercise what do you think about that yeah I think it's a great thing isn't it um, and it's it's common people uh, who have the resources to you know, to, to get a gym membership or to use those machines we see in many of the parks, certainly around this fair city of London. Um, good things flow from exercise. Uh, you do get natural um, endorphins produced, so you can you can you know the runners high, the classic. I also find, and this is a little bit of self disclosure, which I hope you'll forgive, but I often find myself on the one hand struggling to stay if I'm exercising in a gym part of me is really hating it (laughs) and I have these little gremlins that are saying just stop get out leave now you've done enough yeah Um, and if I carry on with it I often find that I get I get really interesting thoughts that suddenly occur to me 
you know, I hadn't been thinking about a particular problem and suddenly a solution mm. was presented to me. And so interesting thoughts kind of arrive. And I think good thoughts for recovery arrive in someone that's, you know, been trapped by yes. a, a cycle of addiction. So, yeah, I mean, it's, mm. I, I think, I think, but even just being outside, you know, walking to the bandstand on Clapham Common, you know, and just noticing the trees and the sounds and the... Being in the moment. Being in the moment and, and, and feeling that that is enough and being grateful for that. Those are the changes that I think occur. And, but, but I think a bit of, you know, as long as you're fit and able, and sometimes people do need to have an assessment, but, you know, a little bit of cardiorespiratory stress... Mm. Um, is is actually a good thing as long as you know as I say you're fit enough for it and uh, a question that I'm asked a lot do you think people have addictive personalities it's a great question again isn't it because uh, there, there certainly appears to be studies that show that some of the what are called sensation seeking traits that um, appear to be exhibited in early adolescence uh, are correlated with future drug use so I suppose this idea of someone that is has a personality that's seeking uh, reinforcement appear to be drawn into it. The other type, personality type, is the sort of sometimes called anxious avoidant. So it's someone that has a much more a kind of they 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 have internally generated negative thinking styles. It's a big mouthful, but mm. you know this idea that they are. They have a pessimistic outlay, outlook. Um, so I think those two, you can put those on the table and say, okay, well, you know, maybe we, we should be concerned if someone exhibits, um, you know, personality aspects like that. We talked about the fact that you could, you could look at a family history and find no evidence in the past. Yeah. We <clears throat> could also bring in to the studio a thousand people with what look like anxious avoidant personalities or, or sensation seeking who've never smoked a cigarette or drank alcohol so it they look like tendencies yeah but it's not fixed okay i mean i i think certainly from dealing with all my patients it doesn't discriminate cocaine you know from your bricklayer plasterer laborer lorry driver warehouseman to your ceo as i said to you earlier i have a, an orthopedic surgeon that i helped who's clean now to um lawyers barristers judges uh, i've seen it all so it doesn't discriminate does it it doesn't discriminate because they've all got the same brain structure it doesn't matter what we do who we are um we are vulnerable to attack from this drug because it releases dopamine really efficiently it stops it being taken back into the storage sites so efficiently and it creates the same kind of greedy needy version of you no matter who you are i think i, I suppose the only thing is you know there are some that you know really really can't afford it and, yeah. uh, and there are some that possibly can for a while, but, but people getting it on tick, John. Do you know what that is? It's a, tick. You ever heard that? I oh, wasn't oh, sure. Oh, what, so what me. happens is when the dealer gives it to you and you build oh, up this course. tick, the slate. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, then they're in debt. Then they're working to pay the dealer. Of course, of course. And then yeah, and then they find that they really can't pay it back. Yeah, yeah. But no, you're absolutely right. It, 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 all, all strata, all is we we've got this across the world distributed everywhere, really. Um, John, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you with Coming Clean With Me. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being here.